Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group and as solo artists, past, present, and things to come. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and a writer about music and musicians for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and several other publications. And I'm joined by my three regular esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hey, Ken, how are you doing? Hi, Alan. Hi, everyone. And Steve Marinucci, probably the world's only full-time Beatles reporter at this point. Mm -hmm. You can read his work in Billboard.com and Access.com, which is AXS.com. And he's also the author of a book, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. Hello, Steve. Hello, Alan. Hello, everyone. And... Last but not least, Al Sussman, the executive editor of Beatle Fan Magazine and author of the book Change in Times, 101 Days That Shaped a Generation. And uh, how are you doing, Al? Hey, Alan. How are you? Hello there, everybody. Okay. In a way, we are sort of heavily tilted towards Beatles, Beatle Fan this, uh, this episode. So I, I, in my really long self credits i didn't mention i'm also a, a contributing editor of beetle fan magazine and our guest today rick glover who's been with us before is a senior editor of beetle fan um he also is uh famously an important figure in the fans on the run group that travels around the world to see paul mccartney's various shows here and there and was just at Desert Trip. Um, his write-up of Desert Trip is on Beatle Fan's Something New blog, and so you can catch up by the time by the time you can catch up with uh, with it. We'll will have you'll have heard the show and we'll know pretty much what he had to say. But um, you should read it anyway. Um, so, Rick, how are you doing? Hi, Alan. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me back on again. Okay. So, um, was it uh, in any way a difficult decision for you to? decide to go to this um i think you prefer indoor concerts isn't that the case well i i do like the intimacy and the sound and the closeness of the uh, in, indoor concerts but an event like this with that lineup uh, it was it was just too much for uh, one of the fans on the run to pass up okay i'm, I'm a huge who fan they, they were one of my first real rock concerts that i, that I went to see <laughs> I um, love Pink Floyd and all the, the spacey music uh, that they play, mm -hmm. and uh, Big Stones fan as well, and, and as Dylan, Dylan too. Mm -hmm. So that was, a, that was a lineup that I could not miss. How about Neil Young? Not much of a Neil Young. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you know, in a lineup like that, there's got to be one that you, you know, have time to go get dinner during. Um, <clears throat> well, I have appreciation, but just not for my taste. Right. Okay. And you got some Neil Young in the Paul McCartney set anyway. So. Yes, yes, he did. He did come out and, and do a couple of treats uh, with with, uh, with Paul's set. And that, that, now, that was thrilling. That, I'll admit that. Mm -hmm. um, so did you just do you go to both weekends or just one of them? No, I just just went to the one. I've, I've had some health issues in the last year or so that I just didn't want to uh, try to if I was afraid I would overdo it if I really did both weekends, but uh, the, the one once in a lifetime experience was uh, a, treat, a treat to be able to participate in that. Mm -hmm. in, in which you went to the second weekend? Oh, the first weekend. The first weekend. The, okay. First, 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 mm -hmm. All right then. Um, so tell us, uh, I guess, your reaction generally to Paul said in particular. You said well, in your review Paul, that he was in good voice and, and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he sound, sounded very, very good for on, on most of the nights. You know, he's got a couple of the spots in there that are that are going to be vocal challenges for him. But for the ninety percent of the show, or ninety five percent of the show, that uh, was was that other otherwise he was really, really sounding good. Sounded very, very happy to be there playing for that throng of people. We had uh, we had good close seats, and the the view from looking back into the crowd it just seemed like an endless sea of people going back as far as you could uh, could see so i know that that was uh as a thrill to be there for me and the audience and i'm sure it was a thrill for the uh for the acts to, to look out at that and uh, get that buzz from them 
Mm-hmm. Band was playing real hot all night. Uh, certainly throwing in a couple of uh, surprises. A little more rock and roll with uh, throwing putting Day Tripper back in the set, and uh, certainly the surprise of uh, why don't we do it in the road? That that was a nice mm-hmm. nice treat. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's also, you know, I mean, obviously looking out at a, a crowd like that's going to going to energize any group, but also oh. knowing maybe that backstage are like all of his peers also listening to the set, you know. So, I mean, that 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 must have had an effect too. Well, I'm sure that went through all their minds of looking looking down the set or the the checklist of who all is going to be performing there. Uh you don't want to be you don't want to be forgotten in that that list uh, you you want to bring your a game to um to whatever you're going to put on the stage there and paul being kind of bookend by the stones and roger waters pink floyd as the headliners on, on that thing uh you you're going to remember the opening or the, the first one for sure and you're certainly going to remember the closing so i think paul felt that they had thrown down the gauntlet for him to to bring his uh top show and from my view, viewpoint he certainly did Mm-hmm. What um, in the set do you, do you think was really the highlight? Something that worked really amazingly well was the acoustic bits in the center. Hmm. I was surprised that a, a crowd that huge and potentially rowdy, un, unruly, would uh, would have slowed down or sh- basically shut up and paid attention to uh, when he was doing the uh, the podium songs, Blackbird and Here Today. He really had a silent audience to play to and the little front porch skiffle bit that, that they do for uh, <laughs> spite of all the danger and, and I love her that, that bit through there, they was really getting a, a great response from that. But the rock and roll, the Beatlemania songs, those were the ones that lit the crowd up. Of course, opening with, you know, he, he did a pretty standard uh, one-on-one tour set list yeah. with, um, you know, mm-hmm. Opening with Hard Day's Night, of course, you know that uh, you you could see the the waves <laughs> of um, thing going back over the crowd when he was opening with that one. Can't buy me love, nice and early in the set. Another you know hands in the air uh, song, and uh, like I said, Day Tripper with uh, little you know the higher energy songs were were certainly uh, mm-hmm. getting the crowd riled up. Okay, so over to Ken. Uh, just judging from the three days, what was the age, uh, um, the demographic like there? Was it mainly, uh, you know, people from, say, their 40s on up? But did you see any teenagers and uh, possibly 20s and 30-year-olds? I think the average age was probably a little closer to mine in the 40 to 60 range. But there were lots of young folks there. There were some uh, uh, surprisingly Young, young folks there that were into it and knew all the words and were, were there not just to be at the event, but they were there a lot. Uh, in fact, a couple of conversations that we had with some 20-somethings were that they f- recognized how lucky they were to be able to see some of these um, literally living living legends and uh, recognizing the chance that they, they've got to see them and that the fact that there may not be too many more opportunities like that in the in the future. And it was funny too. A couple of conversations were, uh, you know, what was it like when Sergeant Pepper came out? What was it like when the, when the Beatles broke up? And, and questions questions like that from the junior set to the <laughs> the senior circuit that uh, a lot of us were. And it was kind of interesting playing um, sort of a guru to them, to, to tell them about what those those days were like to have uh, lived through Beatlemania and, and the fact that I saw uh, uh, talked to a couple about actually seeing Pink Floyd. With uh, you know all the the original members there with um, with what was an, uh, quite an elaborate show in 1975, and uh, compared to the technology that uh, Waters put on the, the for the finale of that uh, that show, it was quite a difference. Forty years later, <laughs> something like that. So, it was, but there there were lots of young folks there that were uh, seemed like they were really into music and appreciating the. Uh, the event for something other than just a festival a spectacle where they were there to see the acts. When you were there, you were there all three days for the weekend. Did you see any, for example, Paul was on Saturday and Neil Young was on first and then Neil joined Paul and Paul did his set. But did you ever see the other artists anywhere in the crowd, in the audience, on the stage, like any of the other iconic acts? Uh, did you witness, say, Bob Dylan 
or, or uh, the Stones or Roger Waters of the Who while Paul was playing anywhere? Or Didn't was it just the two acts for each the, day? It, well, it was just the two acts for each, each day, and I didn't notice any of the other acts kind of mingling in the crowd. There were some celebrities. Uh, Mick Fleetwood was in uh, seen in the audience several times. In fact, I was a couple of people thought I was Mick Fleetwood from the. <laughs> the, 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 the there is a resemblance. Yes. Yeah, yes. I was, I was going to say that. Yeah, really. And a, couple time, a couple of times, some folks who had heard Mick Fleetwood was there came up and, and saw, uh, said, are you? And I said, no, I'm not. But uh, they were, uh, I, I, can, I can understand that. You could have faked, faked it. You could have faked it, Rick. You could have put on a British accent and said, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Facebook recognition tags me some as him sometimes, really, <laughs> or vice versa. That's funny. No joke. Mm. That's funny. <laughs> funny. Um, are... I did run. It. Abe Abe uh, Laborio Jr. was uh, was walking around in the crowd. Talk, talked with him for a while. Um, so, some so, some familiar faces. Um, we know that Drew Carey was in, in, in the pit all three days. Mm. I'm, I'm trying to think of, uh, but th- there were there were several celebrity sightings in the in within the group that we we had, but um, but as far as the majors, I di- didn't see I didn't see Dylan s- s- sitting in the crowd chatting with the the fans at all, or or any of the other acts. Now I thought it was really a great idea for Paul to uh, do the medley of a day in the life and give peace a chance. The chorus of give peace a chance, which he's he's done, you know, for many years mm. as part of his his set list and then for neil young to join him for that because not everyone's aware that neil has performed a day in the life in concert himself so yes. how did that come across the two of them doing that together in your opinion well it was really emotional especially when they kicked into the give peace a chance and you, you could literally look around and see nothing but peace signs and people waving and then uh being affected by, by that that anthem of of, of peace and seeing that that group embracing both the the concert moment and uh, the philosophy the, the the feelings that go with it that, that was that was really something else yeah and uh, why don't we do it in the road I watched it online a little bit surprised <laughs> that uh, you know Paul Paul performed it while he played guitar because you think of him with the piano doing that mm-hmm. even though he's never done it live before it's so piano based. And you think of him at the piano doing it. How did that come across to the crowd? Did everybody look at each other like, "Wow," you know? Oh yeah, there was a, actually too. He was he was on bass for that song. Or why, why don't we do it? But the um, uh, the there there was a, a, a stunned look around, around a lot of the the regulars. We we were sitting there. There were six or eight of us that had tickets together, and um, <laughs> the the looks on our faces was. was priceless for that for that moment because you know anytime you get a, a premiere a surprise premiere tune like that that's a bonus but that particular tune and uh, <laughs> with the mass of people all singing along uh, it was motivational why don't we do it in the road <laughs> true yeah how do you like uh, neil's lead guitar work on the song he has an interesting style doesn't he <laughs> <laughs> and yeah and that's I, right. I, that's I, a great political answer. Mm-hmm. It is the season, man. What did you think of the Stones come together? Well, <laughs> they have an interesting style too, don't they? <laughs> yeah they they threw the they threw the glove down for uh, for Paul to pick up uh, w- with that one, and uh, that was a nice surprise, though. You know, I like the Stones. I I think the Stones are a great gritty rock and roll band, and I, I enjoy. Was they're still. They've still got a lot, a lot of that club band in them. Why, why don't we do? Why don't we do it in the road? Or why don't we do come together? Or, or I think they they would uh, rip rip into just about anything. And uh, the fact the fact that they again not I think every single one of the bands had a an awareness of what what all was going around them. So they 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 probably thought maybe we should give a little nudge or a little nod to uh, this other act that's going to follow us. So, uh, oh, it was funny. <laughs> funniest thing. Mick said two or three times. Mick Jagger two or three times during their set. Thanks to Bob Dylan for being our opening act, or thanks for Bob for warming up the crowd for us. And I just thought that, that was a, uh, maybe a, a little slice to, uh, to to Dylan's status there. Mm-hmm. But Dylan was a per. I thought Dylan was a perfect opener for for the um, for the whole 
whole festival, whole event, went of course the, with the opening song that uh, has the lyric about everybody must get stoned, and I think everybody pretty much took that as <laughs> march, yeah. marching orders. Yeah, really. <laughs> but follow the instructions, and it was uh, kick, kick the uh, whole. Set. He 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 did a, uh, what I thought was a great set, good set list picks from him because some of his shows lately have been a lot of cover and. Mm, sometimes his show, shows are kind of like a metronome, click, 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 click. Mm. It's all kind of the same, yeah. same genre, same feel. But um, I thought that was a really good. Uh, he actually bordered on melodic a couple of times, so um, <laughs> I, I enjoyed uh, enjoyed his set. And Stones burned it out. And um, actually, Paul had another surprise because mm-hmm. uh, since the Stones were there that weekend, yes. he he brought back "I Want to Be Your Man." Yep, Paul gave him a little answer song to um, to that, and he, he said something about that. Uh, he he certainly put an emphasis on the fact that we wrote this song for for them. So uh, a little slap back from from Paul, but it was it had a good version too. It was it was closer to the um, Beatles recorded version of "I Want to Be Your Man" than the, you know, he he did perform that tune on the '93 tour, but it right. was a sort of a Bo Deadly, uh almost reggae version of. Um, that, but this was this was a straightforward rock version near the end of yeah. the show. Yeah. I was kind of hoping that his response would be an actual Stone song. That oh, me too. You know, I, I thought, mm-hmm. it, yeah. was it going to do satisfaction? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Same here. <laughs> or, or we love you. You know. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, Since I think God. he was on that, right? Oh yeah, got the, yeah, got the legitimate yeah, so. corkscrew connection there. Yeah. That's true. Mm-hmm. But oh well, yeah. next time. <laughs> right. So was there we, any surprise amongst the crowd? I just want to ask if that there wasn't any, you know, more cross pollination between the six acts for that weekend. Yeah, there were comments uh, that uh, the the possibilities were there, so I think the expectations were there too. You know, mm-hmm. we the as the second weekend when uh, Rihanna came out with uh, with Paul to, to sing four or five seconds, which is another one that went over amazingly well at the uh, Old Cella concert mm-hmm. there there as well because i think paul enjoyed saying well uh, we we played you the first song that we wrote a while ago and then the most recent song that we just in the hit or uh, just on the charts last year or something like that so right. he could really bookend his 50 plus year career on stage there too mm-hmm. but uh, yeah there, there were some comments about well you know why didn't uh, you know keith richards come out for the big guitar duel for um mm-hmm. Golden slumbers, the end type mm. things, and uh, the you know, potential was there. I just don't know whether uh, how, what the what the details and arrangements, logistics for for making those things happen were. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, Steve. I was surprised, Rick, that he actually played a full set because normally when he goes to these outdoor things, he usually cuts his sets down. Were you a little surprised at that? Well, it seemed like he was giving us the full full set and full effort. Yeah. That, that night. and uh, we, we I was kind of prepared for a a somewhat shortened set because it was a it was a long day there. You know, uh, right. Neil Young played for a full ninety minutes to two hours or so, uh, and um, it seemed like it at least. And <laughs> I I think there was some sort of curfew there too that Paul blew right through. Oh, so, really? Uh, yes. How many? I know, I know, see- you said you'd seen the Who. You'd seen the Who. Oh yeah. In the past, how many times? How many times did you see the Who? Oh, dozens probably. Have, dozens. Wow, have ever, really? Yeah. I saw them back then too. I think I've mentioned it here before. I was at the, and I know you've heard about this show. I was at the show at the Cow Palace when Keith passed out. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Is there a drummer in the house? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it wasn't. It wasn't me. But uh, yeah, I was. We were. Right over to the left side, near the left side of the stage. In fact, the the video that's on YouTube of that is, which seems to have been shot pretty close to where I was standing, because that's kind of the angle I remember. But and I remember Townsend asking, and, and you know we could hear Townsend very well. We could see him very well from where we were, and and uh, it was like you know it was uh, crazy, and a bunch of people rushed up. I mean, hell. For one, I don't play the drums, so there's no way I was going to there. <laughs> but I remember, I remember a lot of people heading towards the, you know, he pointed towards, you know, the gate, and he said, "Go over there if you can play." And you know, a few people. Wow. I never, I never saw, you know, I never saw Scott, uh, whatever his name was, go over there. I don't, at least I don't remember. But uh, you know, obviously, he, he, I remember he played very well that night. So 
But I saw them that night. I saw them built at the uh, Bill Graham Civic Auditorium in San Francisco in 1970. And I think I saw them one other time at Winterland. So, yeah, I saw them. I, I didn't see them dozens, but I, I saw them a couple of times. And then I saw Pink Floyd. I saw Pink Floyd. You said you saw them in 75. I saw them in, I think it was 71 or 72. Mm. And wow. Did they do, when you saw them, did they do a, an ending with the fire... Um, with the smoke and everything like that, that kind of scared the hell out of everybody with the, the with the um, skeletons and all that. Did they do that? You remember that? I don't remember that, but that may not mean it didn't happen. Yeah. There's <laughs> <laughs> another good political answer for you. Um, I, 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 I do remember. remember the intensity and, and the impression that the the show made. Now we were at a big outdoor um, stadium show. And, and they they physically built a pyramid, and I think I remember a plane crashing into the uh, into the pyramid at, at the end, and that was pretty <laughs> shaking. Uh, but um, you saw them later than I did, then, because I saw them before, as I recall, it was before Dark Side came out. Oh wow! Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, because we were, I remember we when we heard the stuff that night, we didn't recognize it. Or it was new. I can't remember if it was really new, but the um, I'm looking up here on what I'm uh, online here and trying to see which. Uh, I don't remember what song they ended with, but it, it, they had these smoke pots at the sides of the stage, and they they blew them all of a sudden, and there were these skeletons, and you could hear the whole audience freaking out <laughs> because they had to because you you know everybody shut their eyes in reaction to the to the light and it was amazing and i also i saw dylan at the uh, the bridge concert um that's the only time i've seen dylan so i have not seen the stones i have never ever seen the stones really Ooh. yeah and at this wow. point I, I i have to be honest at this point i won't um, yeah. i would I would have seen them in seven. I wanted to see them in the seventies, and I never did. And so I then, saw them in seventy two with Billy Preston yeah. on keyboards, Stevie yeah, Wonder. Oh, oh. Well, I love, yep. I love the, I love the films and the recordings of those shows. There mm. are some good, the, some of the best Stones bootlegs. Oh, a couple, that that era, they were clearly the world's greatest rock and roll band at, at, for those moments. No, no yeah. doubt about it. Speaking of bootlegs, there is a recording of the first Desert Trip show, the McCartney show. Mm-hmm. And oh, it's, it's and yeah, what a show. <laughs> the complete complete shows of all of them from the first weekend are up on YouTube as well. Yeah, I have. Mm. I, that's not where I've seen them, but I've I have seen them, and uh, yeah. I haven't seen the videos. I've just seen the uh, uh, the audios. But uh, the McCartney one's okay. It's not as good as some of the other shows I've heard. But as far as quality goes, I mean, it's but mm. it's all there. So. Um, oh, one one thing you mentioned in uh, the the who a minute ago, I will say that uh, in these l- most recent little news clips about Pete saying that he doesn't really care about performing live in the last <laughs> few days, well, he was certainly enjoying himself a, a lot that night in in that desert trip. Uh, he was dancing and bouncing around, lot, lots of energetic windmills, and very very. If if he was acting like he was having a good time, he's a damn good actor. Well, so, I was, uh, I think that that brings up a good point because, like, a, uh, you know, I mean, I remember how he was back then. He and you, you would too. I mean, he was absolutely superhuman back in the seventies. Yeah. I mean, it was it was incredible the stuff he between the jumping and the windmills and and I mean, it, you know, and and how the hell he's still alive, surviving <laughs> after that is is absolutely and you know with all those shows is absolutely amazing. Sure. I mean, was he, you said you say he's still doing win, uh, windmills and jumping and all that stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. He, he's he's airborne fifteen percent of the show. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my, that was uh, the one thing. I, and I think I don't know that I mentioned this here before. If I do, if I have, and people remember it, I'm sorry. The night I saw them in San Francisco in 1970, Bill Graham introduced them one by one, and I remember he introduced. I think he introduced John Entwistle first. Then he int- introduced Daltrey. Then he introduced Moon. And Moon, of course, couldn't get through it without making some <laughs> smart-ass mm. remark and, and, and screwing around. And, and, and had, he had the whole crowd laughing. And then finally, and they were all in the dark, by the way, so they opened up spotlights in each one of them. And, the, and he introduced Townsend last, and he said, 
And finally, the king, Peter Townsend. And Townsend had one of these, if you remember, for the older people listening, one of those imperial margarine crowns on his head. Sure. <laughs> the whole audience just started screaming. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. And launched into, I think it was my generation. And um, But yeah, I'll never forget that. That was just absolutely uh, amazing. And they, they put on... The few times I saw them, they were just absolutely spectacular. They they were just amazing. Oh, they 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 never. I've, I've never walked away from the Who Who show feeling like I uh, I didn't get the full full energy right. and full, full money's worth from from their show. I will say one thing about their show though: they were about the only band with a the set list that was fairly much their standard set list. I don't think they. Uh, they they probably didn't feel like they had to uh, step step up their game to mm. uh, to, to to play that uh, that gig, mm. but they 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 pretty much came out and they did a full two hour set with uh, with the two hour plus set with that, them too. Was that was Zach on drums? Who's on drums? Who's on drums? Who's on drums for them? Oh, yeah, now? yeah, Zach, Zach Starkey's on drums Zach? with the Who. Okay, see, it's, yeah. I I haven't seen them in, in. I think the last time I saw them was. Oh God! Uh, it was a uh, at uh, Oakland Coliseum. And I can't remember how long ago it was, uh, but it was many. It was you know at least a decade ago. But I think Zach was on it. It was after Kenny Jones, I think. And um, maybe but, Simon uh, Phillips. It might have been Simon Phillips. I can't remember for sure now. But uh, I didn't know if Zach was still there. Go ahead, Al. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, no problem. Uh, actually, to go off topic a little bit. Um, I think we've we already done that. Yeah, I think we yeah, are. Really. <laughs> <laughs> the last time uh, Rick was here, because you, you just mentioned a little while ago about uh, your health situation, and the last time you were here, uh, you did, you know, bring us up to date. And I thought maybe you should uh, bring uh, bring us up to date on where things stand now because there's a lot of uh, a lot of your uh, a lot of your friends who who i know listen so uh we probably should get an update well i'd be glad to say thanks uh, over the airwaves here to uh, so so many of you guys and all all the folks that have been so supportive of me through this little what i call distraction for the last year or so uh just for to a recap i got diagnosed about a year and a half ago now with uh, stage four thyroid cancer Went through chemo, radiation, and two different surgeries to, to get that uh, bastard taken care of. And I just got my uh, one-year all-clear checkup a couple of weeks ago. And the support that was pouring onto my Facebook page, my mailbox, my telephone, any way of communicating, and all the visits and support that I got from so many people through, uh, primarily <laughs> through the music connections. This uh, the fans on the run group, the other music connections, and all my friends from you know for the last 62 years now. Uh, seems to me like the the common core there is uh, is music, and uh, the the doctors and the uh, the technicians that were working on me through the the treatments they were they were just uh, amazed at the outpouring of all the support that I was getting from uh, from so many of my music friends. So I just you know get take this chance to say. Thank you individually out there because I tried to put as much thanks as I could on uh, Facebook. But when I would read them back, it always seemed like a mm. Grammys award speech saying, you know, I want to thank my the songwriters, the producers, the little people out there. <laughs> my fan club. I, I would like I would like to say, you know, I would like to be able to say thank you to anyone that's that, that's hearing this. And uh, I try to say it in person to as many folks as I'm meeting because I'm back out on the run and I uh, yeah. I'm very, very fortunate to have had such a wonderful healthcare professional team behind me, a family to support me locally here, and such a wide range of all, all across the world. It's kind of weird that mm -hmm. um, that I that I got that, and it and, and it worked. So thanks again. I'm very very fortunate, and I'm I'm re returning to very good very good health here. I'm, I'm I'm very fortunate with that in many many ways. Thank you guys. That's, Give me that's a chance great. to say. That's great. Now you That's you wonderful. mentioned uh, you happened to mention running into uh, Drew Carey at yeah. uh, at at Desert Trip, but that was actually not the first time you saw Drew on your trip. Is was it? Uh, no, 
<laughs> no, we we were eating lunch. I know, actually, we were eating breakfast at a, at a diner that was just a few blocks away from CBS Studios and had had talked to one of the waitresses there that said that Drew Carey comes in there all the time. And we, we our hotel was right beside that. And we, we just happened to be uh, staying there, looked over and said, well, that's Drew Carey sitting right beside us at the bar where we were having breakfast. So uh, he, he looked like he was going to be friendly and um, just slid over beside him and told asked him if he was going to go to the desert trip because the the waitress had actually told us that uh, he, had, he was planning on going to the desert trip uh, show himself and we just chatted about that he was so nice so friendly we talked about music electronic music the old stuff too and uh, the fact that he was going to be in the pit standing and rocking all all three days he said uh, he'd been to a party the night before with keith richards and ron wood and joe walsh and oh by the way ringo Starr. And was hoping that Ringo was going to come out with uh, with Paul. That was one little I don't want I don't want to say disappointment, but uh, with it so close to Ringo's home out out in L.A., it would have been really wonderful if uh, Ringo had popped in just for a couple of na 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 na's for the for the Hey Jude sure, or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. Meet meeting Drew was, was a thrill out there. Got the we 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 saw a couple of stars while we were out visiting um, in L.A. as well. Saw a, a very very pregnant um, Milo Kunis out there and um some 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 others too we were only in la for a few days before the before the show but meet, meeting drew carey was a thrill find out he was a beetle fan too that was cool mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah I, now i i guess maybe maybe it was just um uh you had some you had at least a couple of shots taken of you on the set of the price is right well we we went to the price is right show just, ah, just for the t- okay. taping of the show, right? And okay. uh, they have they have a photo op set up out outside the show there with the uh, with the wheel, so you can, you can make it appear that you are going to be on the on the show. Ah, okay. But, okay. But That's... I've signed I've, I've signed a confidentiality form uh, to. to <laughs> uh, and, and that's you, you laugh, but there there's about a twelve page confidentiality form that you have to sign. Really? Just as a just as an audience member, and just in case you get picked, you can't uh, disclose any information about winnings or losings on the uh, on the stage. Should you have gotten picked, the uh, the episode that I attended, it was uh, going to air June. No, I'm sorry, January 10th. So if you, if you want to see what I what I can't talk about, watch ah. uh, watch, watch the Gary Price's Right show that day. Okay, I'm, that that uh, that explains I went, it because I. Like, I was kind of, I was almost under the impression that you were selected to be on the show. Mm-hmm. That was an, probably the intention of trying to leave that impression. <laughs> <laughs> you sly devil, you. Yeah, really. Well, if you'll read all the captions and all, all the, uh, the posting information, I, I was suitably vague with the, yes. the, the way I, I was described. <laughs> I remember. Damn. I, I enjoy having uh, having having a, a laugh with with Facebook stuff sometimes, all the time. Sure. Oh yeah. It's gotten a little uh, annoying lately. I, I spend less and less time there. It seems like because I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's this there there's an a, a side and a B side to the record being played over and over in the yes. news lately. Yes. Yes. Like, indeed. I'm, I'm, two I'm ready for, two so. more weeks and we'll be done with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm done. Yeah. yeah. I have to admit I've been part of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Were there any Americans on the? Oh yeah, I guess Dylan for president. He he would uh, he he would qualify as. A I guess. Park. Since you <laughs> mentioned Dylan, we should um, yeah. touch on one of our other topics. I mean, let me read you the lead of a 1967 New York Times review. Oh. The lead is: It will be a good joke on us all if. In 50 years or so, Dylan is regarded as a significant figure in English poetry, 1967. So I guess we could probably have given him the one remaining year to see if it's true. But it turns out, <laughs> it turns out that uh, the Nobel Academy um, does consider him a significant uh, poet, in Amer- figure in American poetry. Obviously, that was announced in between the two uh, Desert Trip shows, so you wouldn't have known when you saw him that he was going to be a Nobel laureate. Um, but what do you think about that? 
Well, I think he has always written some of the most uh, intriguing, um, mysterious, and thought-provoking lyrics, and that's that's one of the things I like about him, mm-hmm. the, the the lyric and the 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 wordplay that it, that he does. So, um, if our I hate to say our generation has got mm. point to one, I can't uh, I can't really think of a of a more appropriate candidate. Mm-hmm. Okay, I should hasten to add that I didn't write that review. <laughs> <laughs> who did? Was, who did? Donald Hanahan. Donald Hanahan oh. was for many years the chief classical music critic at the New York Times. Oh. So, so I don't know why he was reviewing this, but it was he was reviewing the uh, Don't Look Back film for some reason. Oh, oh, right. Um, yeah, I think yeah. it had. If I remember correctly, it was the, the Don't Look Back was actually not released until sometime in '67. So that probably was the right. You know when it premiered. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, there's been there's been a, a bit of um, debate on the internet about whether Dylan is an appropriate figure for this award, and uh, I've, I've I've been surprised to see actually some of the negative comment, especially among people who are more sort of avant garde types who 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 have felt that you know by choosing really a popular figure. Um, mm-hmm. The Nobel Academy is is or whatever they're called is making it um, you know more difficult for for people who do less overtly popular and more difficult stuff. But I don't know. I I, I, I think he deserves it myself. I, I I was thrilled to hear it. And the fact that he didn't he didn't acknowledge it got people pissed off too. Apparently, kind he of, still yeah. hasn't. That's kind, that's kind of yeah, right. That's a, but that's kind of stupid. I think. I mean, that's kind of you know. I mean, gee whiz. I mean, Dylan is Dylan. What what would you expect? He yeah. acts in mysterious ways. Yeah. Right. Well, he certainly does. I guess the next question he's is... He's got that mysterious thing going for him, and I, this may kind of bridge that gap for for his per- self-perception, maybe. And uh, if I acknowledge that, I won't be that... I won't have that distance anymore. Could be a, a, a thought thought behind that yeah i mean i i don't think there are any awards he hasn't gotten yet actually at this point Mm -hmm. Uh, that was probably the last one yeah actually actually stop the presses he has acknowledged it Ah. it on on his website he mentioned it on it says i'm I'm looking at a story from the spin website it says his website's listing for the lyrics 1961 to 2012 a compendium of lyrics for every song he's written through 2012 now features the headline winner of the nobel prize in literature well that's not him <laughs> acknowledging it that's yeah that's right. columbia that's, records basically yeah. well, yeah. it's, it's or whoever's that. publishing the book <laughs> right oh well, whatever yeah whatever. Hmm. The question now is is whether he will turn up at the yeah. ceremony and what he'll say. I mean, you know his acceptance speeches have been a little strange sometimes. Right. You know. I'm betting yeah. on something like, you know, my daddy always told me that when you walk down the street and you see a car, smile at the stop sign. <laughs> something like that. Thank you very much. That way. Yeah. <laughs> Either that or he'll go on for 45 minutes like he did at, um, oh, what was it? The, uh, it was, uh, it was at the songwriters hall of fame or did he, hmm. he was, that he was inducted into a couple of years ago and he went on for 45 minutes about the music industry and, uh, uh you know, took down, took down a few, <laughs> a few people. Hmm. Hmm. But uh, but I don't remember I don't remember the exact occasion, so who knows? Yeah, um, we also wanted to uh, acknowledge the death of Bobby V. The Beatles connection being that they did uh, take good care of my baby on their Decca audition. Um, anyone have any observations about Bobby V? Well, also uh, I'm fortunate to know this because. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Mark Lewison's The Beatles Live Book, but um, one of my favorite things to read is a list of all the songs the Beatles used to perform, mm-hmm. which he does year by year. And um, they also performed another Bobby V song in concert, and that was the song Sharing You, which um, oh, yeah. uh, George Harrison sang lead to. 
as he sang lead to Take Good Care of My Baby. And um, both those songs, by the way, were Goffin and King songs. Right. So, um, yeah, so there, there's more of a connection. And um, I was just reading online, not being aware of this, that uh, Bobby V was also at um, a Ready, Steady, Go, one of the sessions that the Beatles were on in 64 hmm. with them. Mm. And, the Michael, and Michael Lynch also mentioned online that they used a Bobby V recording of She Loves You on a the compilation record by Buchanan and Greenfield called The Invasion. So they didn't use the Beatles version. They used Bobby V's version. Oh, yes. Mm. Right. Yep. So thank you, yes. Michael. That's very true. And, and it's interesting because around the time uh, that the Beatles hit America, uh, Bobby had a, a, he, he had a self-contained backup band. And I believe they were called The Strangers. Mm-hmm. And um, and in early '64, he made he recorded a single, and I'm forgetting the title. Something like I think I'll make I'll I'll make her mine. Something like that. We can look it up uh, later on. But anyway, it's it's very much in the Mersey beat. Uh, you know, kind of we- musical wheelhouse. It's, you know, it's it's very, uh, if you want to call it that, Beatlesque, but or certainly Mersey Mersey Beatesque. So uh, you know, obviously he's one of the artists that were that you know visited one of the American artists like Roy Orbison and Gene Pitney and others who visited England during during 1963 and saw the phenomenon beginning to you know beginning to build, and yeah. so you know right about the time that they hit America, he comes out with a definitely a Beatles sounding uh, record, although it didn't. It didn't do very well, but, um, you know, that's... Uh, I'm actually that's looking way. online here and, and uh, on YouTube, and there is the single I'll Make You Mine. And the B-side, which I've heard before, the B-side, it's called She's Sorry, and that's very Beatly. Mm-hmm. Definitely yeah. like a, an early 60s Beatles song. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so Bobby it. was one of the many artists in America that was affected by the British invasion and the hits became less once 1964 hit and, uh, you know, the Beatles led the British invasion here. Right. Well, they only had one other really big hit after 1963, and that was you know, all the way in 67, uh, come, back, uh, come Back When You Grow Up. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, but in, you know, 1961 was the year that I became more than just a casual listener to rock and roll. And uh, records like "Take Good Care of My Baby" and uh, and "Run to Him" were mm. major favorites of mine during mm. that summer and that summer and fall. And uh, was, the, night, were... the night has a thousand eyes and the early part right. of '63. Mm-hmm. You know, that was, so, was, I was just gonna, I was just going to mention that yeah. one. Yeah, that was a great that was a great song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. "Run to Him" has always been one of my favorites. Yeah, me too. Mm. Mm. Anyone ever run into anyone who was as fanatical about Bobby V as we are about the Beatles? Uh, no. 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 I have. No. You, <laughs> you have? have? Yes, I have. Oh, um, wow. It's uh, <clears throat> a cellist named Julian Lloyd Webber, brother of... Like, um, no. yes. Really? Uh, he is just like, he loves Bobby V. And, and at one point, um, I was able to find it believe it or not, an unreleased bunch of Bobby, uh, a session that was unreleased that I think he might have recorded with the, the Crickets. It's either the Crickets or the Jordanaires. It was someone else's backing band who was... Probably um, the Crickets because he had yeah, a couple of right. albums with them. Yeah. Right. So this was all unreleased stuff. And um, so I was able to provide the actual talented member of the Lloyd Webber family with some <laughs> unreleased material. <laughs> And <laughs> couldn't resist that, you know. <laughs> no, the things Bobby V makes possible that you never would have imagined. But wow! Yeah. So, but yeah, an actual Bobby V freak. I, you know, it's very funny. I, you know, I, when he when he first mentioned it, I thought, well, wait, really, Bobby? V? You're you're fanatical about Bobby V? <laughs> you know. But hey, you know, everyone has fans, and everyone has. This is true. Yeah. So that's right. Yeah, so um, shall we 
move on to the next topic, which is the unauthorized Ringo compilation. Everyone, mm-hmm. everyone, ready for that fascinating? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I, I think the the most fanatical of us about that is Steve. So um, mm-hmm. tell us all about it, Steve. Well, I mean, there's not really there's not that much to tell. I mean, it's it, the I, I've printed the you know, the track listing, and it's nothing that anyone who doesn't have all the Ringo CDs won't have, and it's not EQ'd. So it, I mean, there's some sound level problems on a on a couple of the songs one one in particular i can't remember which one is really comes in really loud and and the earlier ones are a little soft but it, i mean the the point that the point that i made in the write up that i did about it was that the music is fantastic mm-hmm. and I, and i'm going to get in trouble with one person on this in this group when i say it's better than pure mccartney um <laughs> i wonder who <laughs> <laughs> Because it really is. I mean, the music is the music is great. I mean, I was, uh, I can't. I was listening to it. And I really did not expect to be, you know. I I put it on just to you know just to listen to it to see what it was kind of like, and I was and I really wasn't expecting much. And the quality of the songs were just great. I mean, it's I really and and I and I really don't think Ringo gets enough credit, you know, for how good this stuff is. It's down to earth. You know, there's a lot of uh, early rock and roll references into it. Of course, he does the. He goes a little overboard on the Beatle references, with the you know the Beatle lyrics. I mean, that's a you know we we know he does that, and that it it does get to be a little too much. But I mean, the fact that I mean he's got he's got all the other Beatles playing on his song on you know on the songs. Uh, I mean, I, it's just a really good it's a really good compilation, and I think the the uh, it's unfortunate. That he, I mean, I know he's talked about putting one out himself. He supposedly had one in the hopper um, for a while. I mean, that he's been working on. It's too bad that this got out before he did. Uh, although maybe it'll help move him to get his out. Because uh, I, I didn't hear about him planning anything like this. Mm. I know that he mentioned an Apple box set, kind of like what George right. released. Right. But that's that's only the first four or five years of his career, if you're talking about Apple. I had thought it was, I, he talked to Chris Carter, and I th- thought he had said he was going to do a whole career anthology. Um, oh, I thought he was re- referring to strictly the Apple years, kind of like George. Hmm. So, but Steve, even, is, is this yeah. a bootleg, or is it Russian, or is it both? Hmm. It's yeah. Russian. It's an unauthorized Russian. But it looks pretty much like a, a real... I mean, it was on Amazon for a day or so, and it still is on eBay. It was on eBay when I looked a couple of days ago. It's still there. You can find it. It's called Ringo's Greatest Hits. It's it's a it's a Russian unauthorized. I guess you could say it's a bootleg. It look the graphics are beautiful. It's got pictures you you probably have seen before. There's no new pictures. The picture on the cover is the one from Rolling Stone where he's standing in the big star on the beach mm-hmm. with his arms with his arms spread. The and you couldn't see it originally in the pictures that that I saw uh, on Amazon, but the printing on at the bottom of the of the the uh, track listing on the sec on the back side is in Russian. You couldn't. I couldn't see that from uh, you know because it's so tiny. And then, but what gives it? What really gives it away is the track listings say Dick One and, and Dick, Dick Two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But the track, the tracks they chose are all really good. The only time it falls off is is say like in the last quarter of the second disc. There's a few a few things I would have changed. Um, but I mean, other than that, it's a great compilation. It really, really is. And I just hope that at some point he does something like this because he really deserves it. Hmm. And, and but, well, but even yeah. you know, even more so than 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 pure McCartney. Why on earth, since it is an unauthorized uh, Russian album, as you, as you said, Steve, not EQ'd. Uh, why on earth would anyone? Who has any sort of you know hardcore Ringo fan who has everything? Why on earth would they buy 
something like this when all they have to do is simply because it's, it's the Put it together. thing. It's in, yeah. It's, oh, obviously, it's, obviously, you can do that. But the, the the thing that surprised me is that the prices for it that I've seen have not been bootleg prices. Where a, a boot, where, you know, bootleg prices, I, and I think Alan would, you know, would agree with me, are usually actually not cheap. Bootleg prices these days are free. I can't remember the last time I paid this for a bootleg. <laughs> well, except for the, uh, yeah. some of the HMC things, but yeah, bootlegs. Yeah, they're just. Well, if you're talking about, yeah, I know what you're talking about there. I'm, I'm talking about specific. I mean, I, I haven't seen anything as cheap as as this. I mean, there there was one dealer, a Russian dealer, I saw on eBay that had it for five dollars. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, um, that's pretty that close is, to free. That, that may be why you would buy it. <laughs> well, that, 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 didn't, that didn't count. Uh, that didn't count. Uh, Shipping from Russia, <laughs> right? I but see. I mean, hmm. it's still, hmm. still. I mean, but I, I'm just saying, you know, even even the prices, the prices that I've seen have not been extraordinary. That's what. But it, it would be nice if if his entire career span could get a little more recognition because you're right there there are some gems in in his repertoire there that uh, uh, the general public has probably never even gotten exposed to much less got an appreciation for yeah well i think you know? yep. well except that, better, go ahead go ahead except Al. that in 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 august of 2007 ringo returned to capital and they released a a really good 20 uh 20 track and uh, and anthology compilation whatever you want to call it called photograph the very mm-hmm. best yep. of ringo star and they were and this especially with the ongoing success of one they were expecting big things of this album mm-hmm. and you know they did they did a, a good amount of promotion for it and it um the first week out it hit, it hit 130 on billboard's album chart and then dropped and dropped completely off the chart in other words, it was, you know, it was certainly a a failure. And the, you know, it's, <laughs> the problem is, is that, you know, the regardless business. of what the quality of the, uh, of the music is, Ringo does not sell records. Mm-hmm. Product, right. And, mm-hmm. and, and in fact, Ken and I had a discussion, uh, the, I think on Friday on, on Facebook about this because mm-hmm. he's of a mind where he thinks that they should, that they should put together a two disc compilation, you know, that would bring things right up to the, the present day. The problem with that is, again, is it just, it doesn't, especially since, now that now that Universal is basically in charge, mm-hmm. since they they are the parent company now of both Capital and Apple, is that they're just not going to go for something like that. Not in this, you know, not in this current music business, you know, where I mean, you know, it, 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 Paul told the story a couple of uh, in the, the the Rolling Stone interview, I think it was, of mm-hmm. uh, being told that um, uh, that Pure McCartney in its first week out had had charted quite high and asked about sales, and they told him thirty six thousand, mm-hmm. which is <coughs> pathetic, mm-hmm. you know. So yeah. that's you know that's that's you know that that's the new reality. Yeah. Well, for, can for, I stick my two cents in? Please. <laughs> Go ahead. First of all, regardless of everything that you've said, I just think that in general, regardless of what era you're living in, it's always important for any major artist, and I do consider Ringo to be a major artist because of his stature, everything that he's achieved. Every major artist to put out a compilation every, if you can, every 10 years or so, especially, especially if the artist is still very active putting out new music so you can update it. And contrary to what you were saying, Al, and Mm -hmm. going back to our conversation on Pure McCartney, you kept thinking about this as being aimed to the hardcore Beatle fan. No, we don't. Compilations are not geared towards hardcore fans. Compilations and greatest hits albums are geared towards casual fans and people who want to be introduced to an artist, an artist who they're not really familiar with most of their catalog. They want to hear the hits, maybe go a little bit deeper into album cuts, 
So something like this is more suitable. Now, realistically, well, something, what's that? Inconvenient. Yeah, you sure. have it all in one spot. Mm -hmm. If I was going to advise someone who's just getting into Paul McCartney's solo career, what to start with? This is uh, this is just like the conversation with Pure McCartney. I wouldn't start them on the first McCartney album. I wouldn't start them on Band on the Run. I would start them on a Greatest Hits, whether it's Wingspan or Pure McCartney, because it's a good cross section of all the decades and all the music that he released. Same thing with Ringo. Ringo has continued to put out albums, say, once every two years. He's released four studio albums since Photograph. Okay, so and probably he's going to have another one out next year. He's still very active as far as putting out new music. And, you know, so much of his recent material, as you were saying, Steve, on that second disc of this Russian compilation, is really mm -hmm. very strong. In my own personal mm -hmm. opinion, I know I've said this a number of times, with the exception of the Ringo album, I think from Time Takes Time On is the best music he's put out in his solo career for the most part. I think he's had a renaissance period, you know, from 1992 from that album on. And there should be compilations that have some of that material in there so people can know what some of his best material is. So regardless of how it sells, there's always got to be something out there that's in print. And if I was a brand new Beatle fan or I wanted to investigate Ringo, I'm not going to start by saying, oh, let me try Ringo's Rotogravure. That's not the way I'm going to be going about his solo career. I'd want something that encompasses his entire career. So the purpose behind a compilation is far more important to me than the sales. Because over time, the greatest hits or compilations will probably outsell anything else from Ringo's solo career or most artists' career for that matter. So I just think that the purpose behind a compilation is far more important over the long run you know, than the immediate sales. And I, I wish, whether it's realistic or unrealistic, that the record company wouldn't be thinking solely in terms of sales. Mm -hmm. But the problem, pro problem is it's a business. I mean, we've got a, right. we've got a, we've got a marketing man here in, in Rick. And, you know, it's, as I said, the, the photograph collection is exactly that kind of collection that you would, you would give to somebody as a, you know, as a great sampler of, or you would uh, point somebody toward as a great sampler of Ringo's, of Ringo's career up to 2007. Right. And nobody bought it, you know, virtually nobody bought it. And by the way, you said you saw a promotion behind it. I didn't. Yeah, I did. Oh yeah, absolutely. Not I, heard one, I heard a radio special on it. I didn't see anything. On television, yeah, there about was, it. yeah, there was, because they were, they were, they were kind of thinking that this would be kind of like, you know, Ringo's one, and it, uh -huh. and it just, and it just did not happen, the, and especially, and again, especially now, since, uh, you know, with Capital and Apple owned by a, you know, a mega conglomerate, they they they're just, no matter how noble it would be to put out an anthology uh, every, you know, every few years, they're just not going to do it. I mean, that, that icon collection that came out a couple of years ago, again, same thing. It just disappeared without a trace. Yeah. But that wasn't, that really wasn't that good a collection anyway. I mean, that was just kind of a, a tossed, uh, you know, something tossed out, there wasn't any real purpose behind it. Um, and there was no promotion behind that. Right. And, and one thing I was going to mention is that I'm looking at the, the track listing for, for photograph. The only thing that's on, that's not on the Russian album that's on photograph is the uh, act naturally do it with Buck Owens. So there is one track difference, but, but the Russian thing has, a lot of you know has several tracks that the that the that photograph does not starting with uh you know choose love me and you liverpool eight peace dream walk with you uh and even has well obviously it covers the, you know, right. the material from the years since then but, but still, even even, even earlier there's there's uh, the photograph only has 20 tracks up until up into fading in and fading out, which is on the Russian second disc, that's the uh, that's the thirty fifth track 
on the on right, the but it's yeah. but it's a it's a very photograph is a very strong twenty track collection. Well, yeah, and I it like sure I said, it, and and but uh, again, uh, uh, what really impress is impressive about the Russian thing is the quality of the music all the way through, and I'm talking about even the later stuff. So not just not just the early stuff. I, right. I, yeah. I, so I mean, I and I think. As I as I wrote on on uh, my blog on um, that I think he doesn't get the credit for you know the great music and if and and I did take a, a little swipe at at the others when I said that they go off on tangents where Ringo hasn't gone off on tangents uh, on you know on that kind of stuff and either even when he has he's kept his feet on the ground and I think that's really that's really evident here you know so. I just really this really is a sad reflection of the times. And mm. I'm only going to bring up this one other thing, because when we were at the Fest for Beatle fans this past year, I know we were on a panel with Tom Franjoan. And for mm-hmm. some reason, we brought up the George Harrison compilation of Let It Roll right. songs mm-hmm. by George Harrison. And most people were very disappointed with that. George yeah. Harrison deserves at least a two disc set right. his solo career. And he's never had any. Not one. I mean, the best of Dark Horse was okay, but uh-huh. it only encompassed music from the Dark Horse label. It right, didn't have right. the first five years of his solo career. So as far as something that's encompassed his entire solo career, the best of George Harrison was a joke. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. half of it was were the Beatle recordings that George wrote. And, um, you know, even on Let It Roll, they had to include three Beatle songs that he did live at the concert for Bangladesh. So as far as just solo material... From 1970 on, you know, unless you want to include Wonderwall music and on. But uh, there's never been anything on George. Right. That's, that represents, you know, a, a great compilation, say two discs. And, uh, you know, he certainly warrants that. And I believe- for, the, for, the, for the mere fact that Ringo's now had 18 studio albums, I don't think two discs is asking too much. But no. like I just said, it's, it's a sad reflection that. Well, Ringo- how well, much interference... Mm-hmm. Or how much influence or interference would the different record labels have to, to the just, compilation? I was, like that I, was just, I was just going to say the rumor Except at the Russia. time when the rumor at the time about the George Harrison was that it was supposed to be two discs, <coughs> and there were and there were and there were problems that that uh, that prevented that. Mm-hmm. So you know, uh, and that's too bad. I mean, that it really it really did fall down. Um, so I don't know, you know. Uh, are you and, sure that's the reason? Because it's my understanding that Universal now just covers everything with George. Yeah, but this was this yeah. was mm-hmm. this was how many years this, ago? Y- right, this was what uh, maybe about a mm. decade ago, right? Yeah, uh, uh, two thousand and nine. Two thousand and nine. Oh, okay. That's when it was. So, um, you know. But at that at that point, capital was still capital, and Apple were still uh, were still autonomous. Mm-hmm. We could talk about this probably for another hour about the uh, go back to the debate about compilations, and I don't. But but the point I, the really the point I want to make again is that the the Ringo's music is it well deserves more praise than it gets. And I mm-hmm. think that's it's not the compila it's not the the compilation itself. It's the fact that his body of work doesn't get the praise that it deserves. And that is proof of it. And I hope at some point he puts out something that, you know, that takes care of that. But the problem, the problem is that if a tree falls in the woods and nobody hears it, right. You know, um, right. The fact is people just, you know, his records, whether they're the new albums or, or a compilation, his records do not sell. The man Mm -hmm. has not had a, a hit album in 40 years so if you follow that logic then he probably shouldn't even record new albums by himself anyway that's you know Mm. no i'm not 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 if you're you're doing it to move product no if you're doing it to uh embrace your muse yes yeah and i think he's embraced his muse very well in the last uh like you said since time takes time this has been some very unique and and driven music from ringo i don't think he's making product i think he's making the music that he wants to make and and yes that should be appreciated and because there is some really good good tunes and good fun stuff in there mm-hmm, i'd like yeah. to see him do a tour with, I the, agree with that. tunes from the 91 uh, up 
I agree with that, and, and I think the, also that you know, I think we're all kind of spoiled by the idea that the Beatles sold as many records as they did in a time when people bought records. And I think that you know, the fact yeah. is, yeah. they're going to yeah. sell some. They're they're not going to sell they're as many as the Beatles, but they're going to sell some because a lot of us want to hear what he has to say now. You know, and sure. uh, and I think that they just shouldn't be. By they, I mean the record companies and also maybe us and whatever. I, I think just shouldn't be so hung up on what the bottom sales figure finally is going to be. Um, not only do they sell things, but they also sell things over time. You know, mm -hmm. and that's the, what I was saying. Yeah, the record, the record industry. You know, everything is changing now, and it's a really difficult mm -hmm. time for them. I understand that, but you know, in a way, it's almost like the pop industry is like what the classical industry used to be. What they used to mm. say when they got really embarrassing sales figures, like you know, five thousand copies a year of a classical record, is that these are catalog items. They're selling slowly now, but they sell for twenty, thirty however many years, you know, and a lot of those old classical things are still selling because the people are legendary and new people come to admire their work over time and want to start, you know, hearing the things they did, you know, long after they've died. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe pop catalog stuff is like that now too, because uh, everyone's downloading it free or streaming it or, or whatever, but uh, you know, I mean, people obviously have to continue doing what they do, or else what's what's the point? You know, you won't have any musicians doing anything if if it's that's different. right. You know, yeah. And the the mere fact that Ringo's doing what he's doing because he loves it first, you know, that's that's what we should be celebrating as well. That mm -hmm. he's doing this because he still enjoys making new music, and I, and, he's and still, I think... he's still growing as an artist, as far as I'm concerned. And I think the all-star band thing plays into that, too, the, the Muse thing, because, I mean, he's having fun out there, you know, playing live with people he enjoys. So I think, and that's part of the same thing. So God bless him and, and hope he can continue to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay, I think we've, uh, we've touched on a whole lot of topics, and um, it's been a, a, another quickly moving hour and uh really? thanks so much rick for coming on and and giving uh -huh. us your sure thing okay thanks for having me back i, w I will say t a couple more things i was going to say about the desert trip when we were talking about it it was one of the best organized events that i've ever attended mm -hmm. all the getting in getting out getting to your seat getting back and forth from food and uh no no hassles with with the logistics of the show it was really well well done that way and i don't recall seeing one uh person to person issue there was no pushing and shoving there was no line jumping there was no no personality issues going on in the entire weekend that that i saw going on or heard about at all so if they were trying to recreate that uh three days of uh peace love and music i think they were that was a very successful event out there and i really enjoyed talking about the uh the desert trip on your on your show here thanks for having me so much guys okay mm -hmm. thank, thank you again rick so for those of you out there who want to contact us, you can write to us, uh, send us an email at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Um, we're happy to hear comments, criticisms, suggestions, and especially praise. Um, you can, <laughs> <laughs> you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, we're at, at things we said fab. We have a Facebook page, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. And um, you can write directly to me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, I noticed that there was a Things We Said Today Remixed, but it had no followers and no people. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. We'll have to build them up. Yeah, so um, Ken, how do people get in touch with you, and what have you got going on on your, your show and your contests and things? Well, they can always write to me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Um, I do have weekly Beatles trivia in which you can win one of nine prizes every week. And as we had two very special guests on our last show, Glenn Burtnick and Bob Berger of the Weaklings, a.k.a. Lefty and Zeke of the group, 
Um, I am giving away their new album on CD called Studio Two, and all four members have signed it. And I do believe uh, pretty soon we may be giving away some Weeklings releases here on this show. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. And also, I just did a, a recent Every Little Thing show with Jude Kessler as my special guest. If you want to find out what radio stations carry the show, you can go to my website and go to the page that says Every Little Thing. It lists all the different radio stations and all the broadcast times when it airs the show. Jude was a great guest on our show not long ago. She's the author of several John Lennon books, narrative books. And so if you want to catch that show, go to that page, the Every Little Thing page. Okay. And Steve, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, people, Well, let me first say that uh, for anyone wanting to listen to the show, um, we have uh, you can download all of our shows at beatlesexaminer.podbean.com. We're also uh, on YouTube. Just search for things we said today, Beatles Radio. Um, you can get a hold of me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. I have my own personal Facebook page, and I'm and I'll warn you that up until the election, I will I will be doing. You may you may find a political post there occasionally, and uh, <laughs> but I'm and and uh, oh well anyway. But uh, you can also you can talk about Beatles uh, topics, and I swear there won't be anything else at uh, my Beatles. Uh, page Beatles News and Commentary on uh, Facebook Um, and I'm also on Twitter under my name uh, at Steve Marinucci um, and I am always happy to hear from you uh, if if we've gotten some comments about the show and we really appreciate them and we notice that the number of downloads is uh, taking off and, and we really 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 appreciate your comments and your listening and Tell your friends. <laughs> okay, and Al? Okay, you can contact me on Facebook at Al Sussman, uh, on Twitter at ASUSS49, uh, also uh, through Beetle Fan Magazine, and I'm holding in my hand the brand new issue mm-hmm. of Beetle Fan, which, is, jam- which is jam packed. I figure since we have three members, three longtime members of the Beatle fan family here, uh, I should uh, definitely talk about, uh, briefly talk about the, the new issue, which, as I said, is jam-packed with coverage of, of eight days a week of the, the Beatles live at the Hollywood Bowl, the Beatles in World War II, uh, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. And it's led off by a, a great piece by Alan, uh, kind of an expanded piece of uh, – an expanded version of the piece that he did for the uh, Wall Street for Journal. His, for the Wall Street Journal. Yep. Okay, that was it. Right. Exactly. And uh, so, uh, and if you, if I would say, if you want to, uh, you know, t- if you've been thinking about getting Beatle fan, this would be the issue to start with. <laughs> Uh, www.beetlefan.com uh, you can uh, you order a single issue or you can subscribe at the uh, at the website okay and Rick people can find you on Facebook too right that's right do you Rick have any Glover. you have any other websites or anything or uh, I can also uh, recommend the fans on the run page on, on Facebook too that's that's lots of, lots of fun okay So, for uh, Steve Marinucci and Ken Michaels and Al Sussman and Rick Glover, I'm Alan Cozen, thanking you for listening, and we'll see you next time.